just for a little bit kind introduction. I have uh, two more companies actually, but the other ones are in offense, so they're not supposed to be on the website. Okay. So if you have any questions, where'd you that, get the time? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder too. Uh, anyhow, so uh, two apologies up front. First of all, my assistant didn't get a hold of me for two weeks, so he had to come up with a title. Um, I would have chosen a different one, uh, but uh, somehow I'm also talking about bridging technology and society, but you'll see what the, the main uh, talk will be about cyber, strategic cybersecurity and defense in the military area. Mm -hmm. um, the second apology is that I didn't uh, brought the wrong adapter, so I can't show you a sexy Prezi presentation, but this is a PDF I just uh, took from the Prezi, so we'll have to live with that. I'll, I'll try to make, it up, make up for it by being entertaining. <laughs> so, um, first of all, we have to say that the, um, the internet by now and computers are really absolutely everywhere. If you, you look around in a room, you're, you're a professional, you find easily in this room a bunch of computers, the cameras have computers in there, a bunch of other machines have computers by now. And it gets worse and worse the more technologized things are, and uh, it's really every, everywhere we have computers. And unfortunately, we have to say um, uh, that all these computers mm -hmm. are uh, basically castles of sats, because mm -hmm. from a security point of view, um, it, it got a bit harder, but um, it's still the basic truth that everything is hackable. Um, it's, not, not, uh, this, it's not to say that every, everything is easily hackable. That's a completely different story. It's very, very hard right now to hack certain things, uh, like the black market prices or the, even the, the white market prices for this thing here. If you want a full chain, what we call a full chain in the offense market, uh, an entire attack to attack an iPhone for remotely without having the user interact with any stupid cat pictures, uh, <laughs> is 2 million right now. For Android, it's 2.5 million euros if you want to buy something like that. It's very hard to get. So um, you always get it, it's no, no problem, but uh, it's getting more difficult and uh, more expensive. Um, unfortunately, however, most of the, the stuff uh, that's just floating around, that's, this only, the, the very high prices only apply to mobile phones. Those are the best protected devices we have uh, on, in the whole ecosystem. Uh, but everything else, and uh, unfortunately including cars, nuclear <coughs> power plants, weapon systems, fighter jets, is super hackable. It's very easy to get in there. It never takes more than three to five days to uh, hack these things and do fun stuff with it. So unfortunately, everything is hackable, and unfortunately we have to say that we have quite a few takers on, on this uh, hackability of our society. So the one thing you will have heard about is industrial espionage. is one of the core problems in Germany, uh, Germany because it costs us a ton of money. Um, the Chinese are at the forefront of this, of course, in, in Germany. We always catch uh, Chinese spies every week. On the other hand, we have to say that it's a big trend in the offense industry to offer something that is called refactoring. Refactoring uh, by now is a service that offense companies offer. Uh, if you have a cyber attack and you want to do industrial espionage in Germany, for example, and to find the new blueprints of a car, uh, then you can give your cyber attack to a refactoring company, and the refactoring company will make it look 100% as if it's from China. So uh, the Germans think, ah, stupid Chinese again, and they st uh, stop looking because it has an advantage. They don't look behind that if they see the Chinese, what they expect. So they're, they're not asking any more questions, which is nice for you if you're France, for example. <laughs> not pointing fingers in any direction. <laughs> Um, however, we have uh, industrial espionage all over the place, everybody's doing it. Um, the Germans, unfortunately, are not doing it because uh, Germans are very nice. And, uh, right, Nancy? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't dare. Yeah, we wouldn't like dare. the Irish uh, stuff. <laughs> but yeah, pretty much everybody else is doing it, unfortunately. And um, we're having a bunch of groups by now uh, which have professionalized. These are professional uh, groups on industrial espionage which have uh, very clear methodologies, technologies <coughs> they use, bunch of target ranges, but then again, uh, it's very easy to mimic this with these groups as well, so you never really know if it's actually the group or just somebody trying to mimic them, so it's hard to find out. And there's also some surprising trends every now and then in industrial espionage. This, for example, here has um, taken some people by surprise uh, that one of the core uh, areas right now, especially of Chinese industrial espionage, is law firms. Mm. It's not the, the factories anymore. I mean, they're doing the factories as well, but they're mm -hmm. also looking at law firms. And the reason why they're doing that is because they want to subvert merger and acquisition processes in, the, in their whole buying scheme, uh, buying companies, buying land, buying real estate. Uh, they usually tend to hack the law firms involved if there are other bidders to see what the other bidders are bidding and to go uh, higher, uh, just a bit higher than that. So that's how they win all these bids. They're not that smart actually in uh, strategy or mm -hmm. bidding, but they simply hack their, their adversaries. 
So that's uh, industrial espionage. Apart from that, what's more worrisome right now in Germany is industrial sabotage. So industrial sabotage happens in a bunch of different ways. Um, first of all, we have the whole blackmailing thing uh, that's still going on mostly in the small and medium enterprise segment in Germany, mm -hmm. where um, hard drives are being encrypted and you have to pay bitcoins to, to get them back again. Um, but there's also uh, some more professional actors. So one thing that is not well known about North Korea, we know that North Korea has very cap capable hackers and they started hacking uh, in 86 when they got a, a, a help called aid program from China where the Chinese were inviting them to Shenzhen which is still the base of operations for the North Korean hackers and they have some, got some very good education and the way they're using it is quite funny the, the one way they're using it is to put pressure on South Korea and some critical infrastructures banking and, and things like that just mm -hmm. to show that they're capable of doing this and that North South Korea should keep quiet uh, military signaling classic and the other interesting thing is how they're using is is that they're doing ransomware campaigns all over the world to uh, undergo sanctions. Uh, due to the economic sanctions, there's no money in the country, so one way to make money is to become a cyber criminal. And uh, so many of these, I don't know if any of you ever had this problem of encrypted hard drives and then sending money, uh, Bitcoin, to somewhere. Uh, if you had, you might ha may have financed North Korea and uh, in part also <laughs> North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons program because oh. a lot of the money for the nuclear weapons program is coming from ransomware. Uh, campaigns in the West. Mm -hmm. So think about it next time. <laughs> so um, another funny story that happened, uh, just to show you how, how bad and evil uh, these things can be, is with um, pacemakers. So pacemakers had a, a sad history with cybersecurity already back in, what was it, 2007 or something? When, um, that, that was a funny thing, Dick Cheney watched uh, the series Homeland, and then in Homeland, <laughs> Uh, the vice president, whom he could identify with at the moment because he was the vice president, yeah. uh, was being hacked by a terrorist. The, the pacemaker was hacked and was killed by a terrorist by hacking the pacemaker in the Homeland. And uh, he got scared because he had a pacemaker. He was a vice president. <laughs> and uh, so he called NSA and asked them if they could hack his heart. And they did a check and they said, yes, we can hack your heart. We can kill you. Yeah. So he said, uh, okay, we, but that was a big big story big, out yeah. of it, went to all the big yeah. news, so he, he got the pacemaker removed, you know, big, oh, okay. big drama. Mm. So uh, what we thought, the community thought then, okay, well, these pacemaker idiots have learned their lesson, and now they're going back to the drawing board, and they're doing cybersecurity all over again, and because pacemakers really have to be secure, there's no discussion about that. But they didn't, and uh, surprisingly, last year, some, some cyber board hacking company took a look at pacemakers and just scanned for common vulnerabilities you could use to hack these things again. In the six, there's only six big brands, but that constitute more than 90% of the market, and they had over 8,600 uh, easily find, uh, too easy to find vulnerabilities in these things. So that was a big scare, but then uh, the, this one that's a problem in cybersecurity, if you just pushing out numbers like that, usually nothing happens. Everybody's scared and then committees are being drawn together, working groups and governments, and they sit together for years and years and nothing happens and everybody's happy. <laughs> and uh, this time, however, something else happened and this, this company, Bishop Fox, another hacking company, published a detailed report on some of these vulnerabilities, how you can use them to actually kill a patient, which was really a how-to report on how to kill people using one of these vulnerabilities. Which in a way was good because that company with these vulnerabilities was absolutely forced to do something very quickly. Um, so they uh, took a look at the vulnerabilities, they delivered patches, um, and then they, had, they recalled the pacemakers which were built into patients, which was not so nice for the patient. Uh, but unfortunately, they could be patched with a near field uh, device, and so they didn't have to remove it. And then uh, afterwards, of course, people were asking why, why were these hackers doing that? It's completely irresponsible. Mm -hmm. And it turned out um, they were smart enough to team up with an investor who was betting on falling stocks of the pacemaker company, which of oh. course <laughs> was something uh, that happened and which made them very rich. And the funny thing about this story is that everything about that was legal. Now, nobody did anything mm -hmm. illegal. Uh, it's, uh, it's legal to test devices for security vulnerabilities, legal to publish them, um, and it, of course it's legal to bet on falling stocks. So mm. this is a nice kind of uh, super legal... Good, good business training. to get into. Yeah, good business. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm considering it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another interesting... So the most uh, profitable thing where you could possibly do this, if you're interested in joining me in my uh, <laughs> dark race, is with air, air, airlines, air, oh. airplanes. Uh, oh. Airplanes have the problem that uh, they, they... It's basically just... Boeing and Airbus, you know that, and then um, they have the problem that they share large libraries of software, 
And if you find one critical bug in one of those libraries, then all Boeing or all Airbus of a certain brand are grounded because mm -hmm. they're not allowed, the safety restrictions are very strict there in, in, uh, for airplanes, um, because they're not allowed to fly unless this thing is patched, and not just unless this thing is patched, but unless the, the entire airplane has undergone a full cycle of testing, mm -hmm. which takes one and a half years. So in other words, if you find a vulnerability in a Boeing or an Airbus mm -hmm. and you publish it, uh, then this particular kind of Airbus or Boeing is being grounded for one and a half years at least. And of course you can imagine what that does to That's the nice. stock course mm. of the company, especially if you're looking at a very big commercial like the A320 or the Boeing 737. So that would be a fun thing to earn money with. And we're also looking at uh, strategic sabotage, which is also something that's going on. Uh, it's not just uh, commercial sabotage, but also uh, all sorts of military actors right now are sabotaging the power grid. They're, they're uh, planting sabotage attacks in petrochemical areas, which was one thing that mm -hmm. got the German industry very scared because it was German components in German petrochemical uh, installations in Saudi Arabia. Uh, which were being attacked and uh, in this case with the petrochemical areas the attack was particularly uh, scary because it switched off the safety switches which they have in the uh, in the industrial environment so the safety switches are in charge of uh, uh, cooling the thing down if something mm -hmm. bad happens so it doesn't explode so in this case if they would have carried uh, delivered another payload onto this attack which would have caused things to heat up uh, there would be a giant hole in Saudi Arabia right now because there would have been nothing that would have stopped this uh, cyber attack from uh, mm -hmm. creating a giant explosion. Um, <clears throat> yes, and there's also some uh, uh, more scary stuff that's going on, uh, and some because some of those militaries who are a bit more daring uh, or stupid uh, also think that maybe they can hack nuclear uh, weapon systems as well. That could be fun. And uh, unfortunately, that's a bit scary because as a hacker, you never really know what's happening mm. with the hack. I mean, you can have some predictions and a lot of testing and simulation and so on and so forth, uh, but you can never tell 100%, especially not with an adversary's uh, nuclear arm system because that's highly secret and you don't know everything about it. You don't know which kinds of interactions may uh, come into place. Uh, so it's a very, very stupid idea to try to hack nuclear weapons. Um, but we're still having a bunch of uh, militaries trying to do that. North Korea is trying to do it to South Korea, and South Korea is trying to do it to North Korea right now. And we heard rumors that the Pakistanis and the Indians are also interested in the idea. I don't know how interested and if they're stupid enough to go there, um, mm -hmm. but we have to assume the worst, I'm afraid. Yes, in uh, real strategic scenarios, these uh, attacks are then frequently combined with information operations, other measures like hacks on uh, voting systems or propaganda that's being done. You may have heard the news of today that Russia is now shutting off its own internet, so it has 100% control over everything, mm -hmm. which China has done, done a couple of years already. And mm -hmm. Iran has done uh, already. But we, we're seeing in some real world scenarios, and the, the exa a good example was Ukraine. Although I think by now a lot of people have learned from Ukraine you would do smarter things than that. But uh, we have seen a bunch of uh, <coughs> information operations running alongside the entire Ukraine campaign uh, where, where uh, actually uh, the internet was uh, cut off from the West so they could only run through uh, Russian servers and everything was dominated by Russian propaganda. Uh, they were coming out of the, the whole troll factories where and the censorship was going on and they had activists uh, from Anonymous uh, which were uh, roaming the all sorts, all parts of the internet saying, ah, finally Russia is liberating those poor Ukrainians and stupid NATO, go fuck yourself. And uh, what is the language of activists? Not mine. And uh, <coughs> in addition to that, what the, what the Russians, the Russians are very, very Clausewitzian. I don't know, who, who's read Clausewitz? You're a German, you should have. <laughs> so, and the, it's, it's always good in, when you have German generals and then you have to mention Clausewitz and they're happy. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the Russians are actually more Clausewitzians than the Germans because uh, they, they really taken a lot of this, uh, the lessons to heart and one thing that they, they think is very important is that uh, when you're going to war or when you have anything you do in security policy is just creating a narrative, so you're creating mm. a story. Um, and then they, they always tend to look at campaigns they have from this point of view of creating a story about what Russia is doing, who Russia is, and mm. how this, this transports into policy or political interests. And in this case, we had a bunch of supporting hacks that they were doing just to, to support the narrative. And the narrative in this case, of course, was that uh, Ukraine can't rely on NATO. And nobody can rely on NATO. In fact, I mean, it's still the main interest mm -hmm. of uh, uh, Russia just to break NATO apart. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so they did some hacks on the European Commission, they did some hacks on NATO to slow down responses from, from these institutions alongside the campaign. Uh, they hacked the Voting Commission in, in Ukraine in May 2014, uh, which also gave them an opportunity to say in the Russian media uh, that the votes, was, votes were hacked and nobody would have voted for these stupid Ukrainian democratic governments. They all wanted to go to Russia. Um, and they also cut the uh, hacked uh, power plant in Western Ukraine just to show, show some muscle and do some military signaling. Mm -hmm. It's a very classic Russian move. And uh, then, of course, they also did a lot of surveillance. So they did a lot of mobile phone surveillance to find, uh, and, and a lot of internet surveillance to find uh, potential opposition forces uh, in the areas they were controlling. And they had a very funny approach to, to solving this problem because they didn't have uh, um, uh, the money or the capabilities to hack all the, all the very good encryption on uh, some of the better smartphones. And the solution they had was that they would uh, uh, just simply ask the people to show their smartphones in the street, and if it was one they couldn't hack, they would just confiscate it. So that was a very simple solution to simple. undergo uh, cryptographic problems. So <clears throat> that, that was Ukraine. Um, apart from that, we're also looking at some worst case scenarios that we're having. I mean, uh, attacking nukes is already pretty much worst case. Uh, but we're having two other worst case scenarios where we've been very close already in two cases. The one is the loss or the mass manipulation of critical business data. SAP, for example, is a, a very open uh, target for something like that. Uh, we've seen attacks in the wild where you could basically kill any SAP of any Fortune 500 company overnight. And um, the damages in real life are something. We had one company that had uh, 22 million US dollars per minute. Uh, if uh, SAP is not working, and uh, if it's finally gone and all your business data are gone, you, you can just close the doors and go home. Because and that applies to any sort of very big or uh, large enterprise. So that would be something uh, an, an extinction event. Other very critical worst case scenarios would be uh, what we call safety critical fleet attacks. Uh, <clears throat> that is, if you're not just attacking one petrochemical plant, but if you're attacking a thousand at once, which is also very easily possible. Sometimes it's harder to attack one, just one, than attacking a thousand at once. And the same applies to attacking 50,000 cars at once, or something like that, and then you have uh, a massive amount of dead people. So um, those are just some of the scenarios. Uh, one question, of course, is why is all this possible? Basically, uh, the, the problem is that what we have is old IT, what we call like old IT, the, the common legacy uh, mm -hmm. IT is basically broken. It's full of vulnerabilities, full of structural problems. Uh, the technical complexity is much, much too high. It grows uh, ever since. Uh, they have no control of the architecture or the periphery of the architecture anymore, the, the suppliers. Apart from the mobile phone guys, they did a very good job over the last years too the architectures, but it's only only applying to uh, the core of the telephone again. If you're looking at, at one hack WhatsApp, for example, WhatsApp hacks mm. right now, I believe, are, are a very low price, 80,000 or something, mm. uh, sell very badly. And um, yeah, so unfortunately, it's, um, it's uh, with the kind of IT that we designed over the last 40, 50 years, it's very easy to get in there and uh, to do certain things. And it's a problem that's quite structural and very hard to, uh, to, to address uh, on a technical level. So it's basically not, not solvable on a technical level. And then the other problem is that the entire problem at large is extremely difficult. So if you're really looking at the, the, the cyber security problem at large and you know all of its different dimensions, like the regulatory aspect, the industrial aspect, mm -hmm. the IT security industry, problems of the IT security industry, problems of the tech industry trying to implement cyber security, problems, structural problems of the big IT vendors, all this kind of stuff and all the stuff you would require to do to solve just one little vertical uh, of this problem, it's so complex that nobody's competent of doing it in, at all. And so um, I'll be honest here, if we're among experts, we just had a session like that with uh, in, uh, at German insurance companies with some of the top worldwide leading uh, cyber experts sat at a table. And uh, the first thing we agreed upon is that each of us only understands maximum 30% of the problem uh, because it's so difficult. Yeah, so that's making things um, very difficult. And um, one area where this is surprisingly bad and this is just something I want to uh, point your attention to is in the Western militaries. So uh, this is a sort of a, a new problem because you would always think that, ah, finally, the good guys from Pentagon or DARPA, they will know what to do. And then mm -hmm. they have the money and the understanding and the, the power to, 
uh, get on a tough security problem and actually find out what you can do about it. Uh, but you're wrong. They're, they're surprisingly bad at this in, in uh, many different respects. So um, I know we all like Britain's here, so uh, I brought an example from, uh, from the UK. And one example was that, uh, that then that's actually plaguing the whole defense industry, that they're based on old IT, which is very mm. easily uh, attacked. So this is something you can uh, easily remote control from, uh, from, from your coast. Uh, if you're seeing it run by uh, the new coast, you can just hack it a little and then <laughs> play around with it. And, um, but this is not only uh, happening in the UK, it's also happening in the Pentagon, and this is also from last year. Uh, they made an assessment of all the weapon systems which were being produced by the defense contractors, and they're all super vulnerable for uh, cyber attacks, which is pretty bad, of course, because you can just simply hack into these things and then uh, remote control the, 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 the um, Predator drone and the Hellfire missiles and Patriot missiles and everything. So it's really uh, quite an open target, surprisingly open target. And uh, one, one of the main reasons why this is the case is that militaries, as to, in as much as defense contractors, and in general, I mean, this is a problem we have in the, in the higher deep tech startup field, um, the, the, doing your own startup or working in a startup environment where you're earning a lot of money, you're having nice working conditions, I mean, for these high-ranking experts, um, is a lot more attractive than working for a stupid Ministry of Defense or uh, stupid armed forces where you have to come up to service in the morning and then look proper and you can't just go and will leave whenever you want to. Uh, things like that, same in the defense industry, so nobody's going there. Uh, none of the good cyber experts is going voluntarily to, to where they should be going, to, to the militaries or to the intelligence services, so they're constantly out of talent. Constantly out of town. It's a very, very bad situation. You have, I can, cannot tell you the numbers because that's super secret, because it's so super embarrassing. But <laughs> I can tell you it's uh, very, very bad. And uh, on top of that, um, the surprisingly, many of the offense institutions are very good bad at defense as well. So NSA uh, loses all of its weapons on a regular basis because they're being hacked, because they're having insiders and OPSEC issues and whatnot. So uh, on a very regular basis, the Russians get the, all the good stuff from NSA, but unfortunately, the NSA is not getting the good stuff from the Russians. So that's an asymmetric uh, situation that we're having. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, uh, unfortunately, China and Russia are very good at this because China and Russia don't have to compete with the private sector for talent. Mm. If you're a good hacker and an amazing AI developer or whatever, you don't get a choice to open up a startup or to work mm. for Amazon when you're in Moscow or in, Pitt mm. or in Beijing. You have to work for the government. Mm. There's no, no discussion about that. You're getting still a decent salary in comparison to other government mm. uh, uh, entities, but uh, you have to work for the government. Unfortunately, we have to say that the, uh, due to this, the Russians and the Chinese are far ahead in the game, mm. especially in offense. This was one recent example of how um, this is a board, a chip board, and the, the tiny little speck you see there is a tiny little, super tiny little uh, espionage chip the Chinese planted on there. Uh, absolutely brilliant engineering was delivered to uh, tons of companies and government institutions and uh, took them years to find out what they did. So this is just uh, showing on, on what they're doing. And the same is also happening now in AI because uh, Russia and China, of course, are also getting all the good AI experts into the armed forces, into the intelligence forces, developing weapon systems, developing intelligence mm -hmm. systems, whereas all the brilliant good AI experts in the West are working for consumer electronics to make your experience with Siri more exciting. So, uh, and unfortunately, that creates a situation where we are uh, having much better entertainment, uh, but uh, much uh, very big uh, geostrategic losses in comparison to uh, Russia and China. And unfortunately, that is a bad situation because Russia and China, you may not know this, but they are trying to convince a lot of countries right now, especially in Africa and South America, to turn more towards their model of uh, government. Mm. And uh, that's sort of a hidden uh, game yeah. going on there mm. in diplomacy, especially where we are trying to come to these countries and tell them, hey, democracy is great, and uh, why don't you try that? And then mm. they say, well, what do we get in return? And we say, um, gender training, maybe? <laughs> and uh, then the Russians and the Chinese come and say, hey, totalitarianism is great. You can know everything. Everything is super secure. Don't mm. worry. And here's a bunch of tanks and some guns and infrastructure. And so um, we're not very good in the game right now. So now, finally, to close up, uh, what are we doing at our institute? We're, we're trying to, because this is such a complex problem, we're uh, trying to question uh, what is considered to be conventional wisdom in this space. And we're doing a lot of government consulting um, and also building technologies. Also, 
that's something I do in the company is more and uh, propose more disruptive solutions to basically uh, shake the shake the the, the boards uh, of the game a little. So some some things that we are doing is uh, we're trying to beat on uh, standard IT security solutions and uh, not just tell people that they're bad, but also show them that they're bad. So we're, we're hacking IT security solutions, for example. It turns out that they're surprisingly bad at security themselves. And it's, uh, sometimes it's easier to get into a, a, a large system if you're hacking the firewall and not hack, trying to hack some core system or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's something that we know we come up uh, and, and something that we did in practice. We came up with a buyer's guide for small and medium enterprises in Germany. We came up with criteria for insurance, uh, which they're putting out now on industrial insurance. That, that had a big effect actually in, in Germany because we told the insurance companies, if you really want to do industrial insurance for a big production site, uh, because they have to pay, of course, when the production site breaks apart, and then you have to have these, I think it was 180 criteria for IT security uh, fulfilled to this level, so you can be sure that there's no cyber attack happening, which you cannot uh, exclude from the contract, because in, in retrospect, you will not find out that it was a cyber attack. And uh, due to that, two, two of the large German enterprises lost their industrial insurance because they were too, too, uh, too speedy doing industry, industry 4.0 things, and uh, they now have some shabby insurance from somewhere, I don't know, but it's not uh, real. Uh, the other thing we do is that we're trying to point out the market and policy failure. Uh, we have a very strong market failure in this field, the standard Akerlof, uh lemon market problem in IT security, because you cannot assess the quality of the product up front. Uh, you're just buying what is cheapest to get you through compliance, and that's usually not a good choice. And uh, on top of that, we're having policy failure, because in such a case, if a market is failing to deliver what it promises, then of course the, the, the standard rule is that policy should come in there and regulate the market, so it, it delivers something like a functioning seating belt, and not just a seating belt, it looks like a seating belt. Um, but unfortunately, policymakers are too stupid to understand the problem, and so they, they like to invite lobbyists to tell them what to do, and uh, that, that only deepens the market failure at this point. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we're doing is that we're having, uh, we do know uh, of solutions, actual solutions of the problem. Uh, one solution, for example, is called High Assurance Cyber Military Systems. That's a paradigm in research, international research, uh, which is building unhackable microsystems. It's, they're not use, useful for uh, standard uh, laptop computers or something, because those are too complex. Uh, but something like a car or a sensor or a camera uh, for, for low-end low stuff, uh, you can use unhackable, build something that's unhackable, actually. So this is something, a paradigm that we're pushing into the German industry right now uh, successfully, and then we plan to showcase more often and export more often. The U.S. is uh, doing this, by the way, as well, and they're currently giving a, a lot of money to Northrop Grumman and Raytheon to, to develop these paradigms. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then we're trying to come up with a new common sense. So just two, uh, two examples out of that list. The one, uh, the one uh, example is that software companies are not liable if their products are uh, shabby and if they have tons of security vulnerabilities. That's a friend of mine, a hacker, used to say the only two industries uh, who are not liable for their products and uh, call their customers users is the, the cocaine mafia and the software industry. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this is something that we pushed into the German government, that liability gaps are not acceptable and uh, there has to be software liability for very bad bugs and very bad mm -hmm. software issues. And another uh, thing where we're trying to create more common sense is that safety and security must be on, on par. So if you're mm -hmm. having a, a, something like a pacemaker and you have a ton of safety engineering so the thing works under any given condition no matter what happens, but absolutely no security, and any teenager can hack into that and kill a thousand people a day, then that's just not acceptable. It's not, not uh, proper common sense. So security has to be on the same level as safety. Mm -hmm. So this is also some, something where we're trying to develop a new common sense, um, at least for the regulators. Yes, so this is some of the stuff we do. Um, and that ends my talk, and I'm open for questions. <laughs>